Welcome to Highbrow Lowbrow, the show where our podcast hosts Steve Pyle and Dan Slattery pit high art against low culture. In this special war movie themed episode, Steve discusses the World War II murder mystery The Night of the Generals. Is it a perfect marriage of two genres, war and mysteries, or does it fail on all fronts? Dan argues that Rogue One is among the best films of the Star Wars series. Does it hit the target, or is it just another LucasArts misfire? As always, dear listener, the final decision is up to you. Beware, spoilers ahead. Enjoy the show. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Highbrow Lowbrow. This time we are following a kind of military war film theme. I'm doing a traditional war film, you might say, traditional in some respects, uh, and Dan will be doing a uh, a science fiction slightly more unconventional war film. Anyway, my highbrow pick for this episode is the World War II film, The Night of the Generals. Now, if you haven't seen this film, I want to say it's an epic war movie, as well as being a melodrama, a murder mystery, a very clever and sophisticated piece of historical fiction, which merges fictional characters with some of the uh, key events of World War II and indeed its aftermath, because this film jumps forward 20 years once the conflict has ended. It's going backwards and forwards in its uh, time frame. And it's a genuine prestige production. It's British, French, US co-production with filming that took place in Warsaw, Munich and Paris. But let me uh, first describe the plot. It begins in Warsaw, 1942, during the German occupation. And a prostitute is killed at a bordello. And a witness who is hiding from the screams sees the uh, grey trouser leg of a German uniform. And more significantly, he sees a carmine red stripe running down the leg, which means it must be a general, as only the generals have that carmine red stripe. Omar Sharif plays a German officer who's called in to investigate because the Polish police say this is too political for us. This, This needs to be handled by the Wehrmacht. And Omar Sharif deduces that there were only three generals in Warsaw who were without alibis uh, on the night in question that the murder took place. These three generals are played by three great uh, British actors. Charles Gray, who plays uh, a philandering general. He's married to uh, Coral Brown. Coral Brown is somewhere regular on our show because we've done Xanadu and we've done Fear for Blood in the past. Anyway, his wife's a Harrodon. And uh, they have a beautiful daughter played by Joanna Patet, who, Coral Brown, who's this fanatical Nazi, she's a true believer, wants her daughter to be married off to General Tanz. General Tanz is one of the other suspects because he was also unaccounted for. And General Tanz is played by Peter O'Toole. Tanz is a fanatical Nazi. Unlike Charles Gray, who's a philanderer, Tanz appears to be kind of asexual, although there's hints later on that he might actually be sexually confused. Peter O'Toole does a great job playing him. He seems to be modelled somewhat on Reinhard Heydrich, a kind of younger Aryan Nazi. The third general who makes up this triumvirate of suspects is played by Donald Pleasance. And as the film goes on, we realise that Donald Pleasance is uh, anti-Hitler and he, he is indeed involved in the numerous conspiracies to kill Hitler and overthrow the Nazi regime. Anyway... Omar Sharif is a brilliant detective because even though he knows that this investigation is dubiously, you know, complex, that you can't just arrest German generals for murdering prostitutes, especially Polish prostitutes, who are pretty, you know, right at the bottom of the pecking order. He fanatically believes that justice is blind and he wants to bring justice for this poor woman and arrest this general. And the great theme of this film is how does one man's humanity survive when society itself is uh, descending into the barbarism of world conflict, indeed the worst conflict in terms of human loss and, and, and barbarity that the world has ever seen. So the Warsaw scenes are very interesting. Then the case goes unsolved and suddenly we jump forward to July 1944 and it's Paris. Now all of the principal characters have reconvened in, in, in Paris. The Normandy landings have gone ahead. The Allies are are in France. They're making progress. The Germans are losing the war comprehensively by this stage, but they're still occupying Paris. And Omar Sharif finds himself investigating the crime again. And this is where it gets interesting. This is a kind of long diversion with Tom Courtney, who plays this young German soldier who really doesn't want any involvement with the war, but he's been turned into like a, a propaganda pawn by the German war machine because his battalion was wiped out on the Russian front 
and he was the only survivor. So Goebbels' propaganda machine rewrote the story that he single-handedly killed 20 Russians, which he certainly didn't do. And, he, and he's in love with Joanna Patat, the beautiful woman who's supposed to be married off to Peter O'Toole. And sure enough, there's another murder of a prostitute and Omar Sharif's there to investigate it. And slowly he's closing in on his man. But uh, as any history buffs will know, what happened in July 1944, there was the bomb plot of the numerous plots to kill Hitler. The bomb plot was the one that got the closest to succeeding and could have changed the course of history. I suppose it's beneficial to the Allies that it failed because by this time Hitler was so demented, he was he was leading his, his armies to complete disaster. And if someone smarter had taken over, then... Um, then the war could have gone a little bit differently. So I think that's all I'll say about the plot. This is a film I really, really enjoy. I think it's because of the mixing of genres, it's different to any other war film that I can think of. Uh, it's directed by Anatoly Litvak, who specialised in epics such as Mailing and Anastasia, you know, some, some Oscar-winning epics. And it's scripted by Paul Dane, who was a veteran and special operations executive and was an expert at um, literary adaptations in the films, such as Goldfinger and The Spy Who Came From The Cold. Co-written by Joseph Kessel, who served in the Free French Air Force. So there's a lot of military authenticity to this story, and also to the different settings. And Gore Vidal did some uncredited work on the screenplay as well. So you've got great writers involved in this. It was adapted from Hans Helmut Kirst's uh, novel of the same name. And one of Kirst's key themes is How Does Humanity Survive? when the society is collapsing. Also, elements of the story were taken from James Hadley Chase's novel, The Wary Transgressor. Now, at two and a half hours long, this is a fairly long film, probably not as long as other films like, you know, The Longest Day and Is Paris Burning, other war films of the era. And in fact, although I haven't read the novel, I read a synopsis of the novel, and they did do a good job of cutting out subplots that would have gone nowhere on screen, uh, such as this is one of the generals makes a speech to a French audience in which he apologizes for the uh, German occupation. And of course, this uh, raises the ire of the uh, Gestapo and uh, someone has to intervene to get him to stop him from being uh, carted off to a concentration camp. And that's cut out the film. And I mean, rightly so. Some, when you've got a big, epic, chunky novel, you think of those doorstopper novels that were popular in the post-war age, then some of it will have to go to make it onto the screen. As I mentioned, the writing is excellent. The direction is excellent. It's it's an old hand. He knows what he's doing. The cast is wonderful. Um, if you're a Peter O'Toole fan, this was his 60s period, just after Lawrence of Arabia, where he had the most clipped, articulate voice. It was like a, com a computer or something, uh, or a typewriter, because at one point, Carl Browns asked him, why have you never married? And he's like, no opportunity, deeply regret it. <laughs> it's just such a sharp voice. And then in the 70s, all uh, all of her, o O'Toole's hell racing began to uh, creep up on him and he got much, much more gravelly uh, voice. But uh, I, I, I love O'Toole and I think he does a great job here. And, and in support, you'll recognise actors like uh, Nigel Stock, John Gregson, Gordon Jackson, Michael Goodliffe. You know, just wonderful, wonderful actors. Now, I'll also look at some of the negatives, and I was kind of struggling to think of negatives, but, but probably the biggest one, or one that you will at least have to address before you begin to enjoy the film, is that it's slightly eccentric casting to cast Omar Sharif, uh, an Egyptian actor, as a German officer. Now, this was 1967, and by which time, blackface, brownface, Asian face was being phased out. Uh, quite rightly, it was, you know, it was seen as uh, regressive and, you know, for want of a better word, racist. Uh, the, the most egregious example would be Mickey Rooney playing a Japanese man in Breakfast at Tiffany's. You know, that's just a you know, disgraceful performance that mars an otherwise very, very good film. Omar Sharif, you know, played a um, Russian doctor in Dr. Zhivago. He played a you know, uh, Jewish gambler in um, Funny Girl. He played Che Guevara. He played um, Genghis Khan. He played all manner of national Personalities. So I'm not sure if they put something on him to white him up a bit. I can't tell. But if you can get past that, it is a slightly bit of eccentric casting. But of course, today we have colorblind casting. So you can watch a, a drama set in Regency England and you've got black actors, you've got white actors and you just accept it. You don't question the fact that there wouldn't have been black aristocrats in, in 18th century England. You, you, it's just like you accept the drama going in. So, you know, I'm happy to, to, to walk past that. Merging of genres, I mean, perhaps the film tries to do too much, but frankly, 
I admire its ambition, and that's why I'm picking it as a, as a highbrow choice here. Perhaps there's not a huge amount of mystery as to who is the killer of these prostitutes. You know, you could probably guess, you know, guesses you make early in the film may be on the money. Yeah, there, there aren't any kind of usual suspect style twists here that turn everything on his head. But in a sense, the mystery of who did it becomes less important as the film goes on. And it, it becomes more about uh, Sharif's kind of relentless quest to see justice for this uh, crime. A couple of goofs I was reading, and I only thought about this, but obviously the red stripe belonged to the Wehrmacht generals. And when the film is introduced, Peter O'Toole is a Wehrmacht general. But then when we jump to Paris two years later, he's an SS general. But it makes sense for him to be an SS general if he's based on Heydrich and if he's a fanatical Nazi, the SS was the much more fanatical wing. If you haven't heard of this film, and I don't think it's the most famous film of, of any of the principal players, although I think, you know, it's up there with their best. There's a reason perhaps why you haven't heard of it. In the 1950s and early 60s, war films had been, you know, extremely popular because war is a terrible thing to live through. But then as soon as it's over, we tend to get nostalgic of anything that has passed, even, even harrowing things. And um, Royal Navy films and Royal Air Force films were particularly popular in Britain because they were seen as the more dashing films, whereas uh, army films, uh, PBI, Poor Bloody Infantry, they took the majority of the losses and they were the slightly darker films, so they weren't as popular. This is a darker film, but the same year this was released, a little film called The Dirty Dozen was released, and that turned out to be the massive hit because The Dirty Dozen reflected contemporary life in that it reflected the Vietnam War which was the last war where the US had a, a draft system and, you know, a deeply unpopular war. There was a counterculture at the time. And if anything, the duty doesn't in there, the fact that there are a ragtag bunch of soldiers, in fact, many of them are facing execution and whatnot. They reflect a hippie culture. There weren't many war films, you know, made from the late 60s throughout the 1970s. The Dirty Dozen spawned its own genre in terms of hippie World War II films of ragtag soldiers, such as Callie's Heroes and the original Inglorious Bastards, where they were quite kind of schizophrenic. They didn't feel like the war films that had been earlier, which had been about either the specific operations of World War II or the specific campaigns of World War II. The British one called Play Dirty, which is one of my favourites of that particular slightly countercultural World War II films. So unfortunately, it was a little bit unlucky that the, the timing wasn't right. It didn't turn into the big hit, either critically or commercially that I felt it deserved to be. But it's a film I discovered when I was a teenager uh, on VHS. I bought a copy. I, I just saw the cast on the on the poster. In fact, the poster itself kind of gave away who the murderer was. But, you know, I didn't care. I loved the film. I, I just put it on and I just got swept away in it. You know, and it was a real prestige production shot in Paris, Munich, where the post-war scenes are filmed. And actually, Warsaw, they managed to pull some strings because, of course, this was the days of the Iron Curtain and somehow they managed to get permission to film in Warsaw as well for some scenes. And it brilliantly mixes key events like the German attacks on the Warsaw Ghetto with the bomb plot. Oh, I should mention that there's a brief but very uh, memorable cameo uh, by Christopher Plummer as Erwin Rommel relating to the July bomb plot. So, you know, it's a film that I love and it's a really well-made film and I think an engaging and a memorable one that you might stick with you for a long time so it is my uh, highbrow recommendation for this episode the night of the generals I hope you enjoy it so like I said to Steve before we started recording this dear listener this one was actually on my bucket list of films to watch um sometimes so when Steve brought it up I was looking forward to it and I enjoyed it but not to the same level as you Steve and I think you've touched on what the problem is. It's like three movies in one, and that's one movie too many. I thought shoehorning in the bomb plot was simply an excuse to off one of the characters. And I thought it could have done without the bomb plot, or it could have done without the Tom Courtney romance thing. Mm -hmm. And for me as well, once we knew who the killer was, I won't say who it is, there's not really any need. Once that was revealed, I thought the film ran out of steam. In the same way, for example, I don't like Columbo because you knew who the killer is and it's all about trying to catch them. I prefer the mystery. And for me, the film would have held up if it had maintained the mystery to the very end. I mean, it's a very good idea. A murder, take, a brutal murder. I think it's a disembodiment, basically, isn't it? Although you don't see it. It's um, pretty gruesome, yeah, yeah. And it's suggested as such, yeah. 
and uh, like Jack the Ripper esque butchery. Again, like any good horror, shall we say, it's hinted at rather than seen. And I think the whole premise that it was, you know, all he could see was a general through the keyhole for me is a great mystery in itself. And I think the film would have held up had it, for example, gone round all the suspects, showed a bit of their lives and played with the viewer a bit. And then at the end, done the big reveal. Donald Pleasance, for example, it seems to play baddies really well. And Peter O'Toole. He's very ambiguous as a character. I mean, at one point, he kind of he's having people set on fire with flamethrowers, but then on the other hand, suddenly he's concerned about the kids that they've got enough food. They play it quite well that he's morally ambiguous, so you're not quite sure whether, before you know who the killer is, to like him or loathe him, really. I mean, on the one hand, he's a ruthless Nazi. On the other hand, he's kind of got moments of humanity. Yeah. And, well, Donald Pleasance just says a monopoly and playing unpleasant characters because he does very well. That was my main problem was I thought there's one too many films in this. But Peter O'Toole's mannerisms are very well done. And he is, whenever he is, like having his, I suppose, seizure, for want of a better word, or turn, or when you just know that something's not like, like for example, when he's in the back of the car being driven around by Tom Courtney or when they're in the museum. And you just, something isn't right. Or when Courtney walks in and discovers the mirror's been smashed. It's all kind of little psychological things like that. Yes. That, that help. It shows that O'Toole, when he wasn't kind of hell racing, he, he was a very good actor. I do believe, though, that O'Toole and Sharif were getting paid less than Pleasance combined. If you add up the salaries of O'Toole and um, Sharif, Pleasance was getting paid more than the Bears combined. And I think it was partly as part of the contract for Lawrence of Arabia. And I was just reading up as well. Apparently, Gore Vidal encouraged, he urged Spiegel to use a hot new director. Yeah. But Spiegel chose Litvak partly because Litvak owned the rights to the novel. I wonder, would the film have had a bit more pacing to it if, if a newer director had come in? Sometimes a director can direct an epic Sometimes you need something to have a bit of life to it. No, I'm not saying old car chases and bang, bang. But yeah. there are some points in the film where you just think, what is the point of this? You sometimes wonder, should the Chekhov's rifle principle be brought into play? You know, why am I being shown this if there's no obvious need for it? But I did enjoy it as a film, I have to say. I mean, and I'm glad I watched it, and I don't think um, my time was wasted. I just thought it could have prolonged the mystery a bit more. It could have maybe... It could have lost half an hour of its running time quite easily, I would have thought. Because it's two and a half hours, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But like I say, they did cut stuff out of the novel, so they, they didn't film every little thing. Yeah. Um, I wonder, with the abundance of plots, like I say, this was something of a transitional year for war films and what you're saying about Gore Vidal's comments, whether they knew something was in the air in terms of war films had to change, and that's why... They were quite ambitious in terms of uh, cramming it with so much plot. And perhaps not all of it works. What can I say? When you love a film, you tend to forgive it certain things. It's actually shorter than films like The Longest Day, which was trying to show D-Day for everything that happened at D-Day. For instance, you see the parachute jumps, including the American GI's shoot got caught in the um, church spire. And you see the German plans or the Germans being caught off guard. You see the beach landing. You see, I think you see every one of the beach landings, including the really bloody one, uh, Omaha. And uh, yeah, I'd like to touch on a few things you say there. Yeah, I think O'Toole is brilliant. And like you say, he's a massive contradiction, such as like he'll he'll only drink water in public and he, he'll inspect the glass for cleanliness. And then you see him in the back of the car and you realise he drinks like a fish. The smashing of the glass and the fact that uh, he insists his bath water has to be a certain temperature. He'll have one of these soldiers, uh, you know, confined to barracks because his fingernails are dirty or and, and things like that. But also the fact that he's sexually ambiguous which apparently I've, I've heard Heydrich himself was also a bit sexually confused but the fact that you could probably never have a relationship with, with a man but he does do this flirting and his rage in other regards the fact that he's the bloodiest of the generals because he he served at the siege of Leningrad which was a particularly brutal one and uh, Joanna Patet his, his would-be bride uh, says to him oh is it true that you use dead bodies as body bags you know he says the story is exaggerated and one of his men said John Gregson who's his loyal uh, deputy says you know I've seen him in the field I've seen him on the battlefield you know cradling a 
with the man and you start to think, hmm, is that cradling a little bit, you know, slightly sexual in nature? But I think O'Toole does a wonderful job here. But I think they all do. And, you know, you're saying Donald Pleasance. It's interesting to see, you know, Bond fans, uh, to see Donald Pleasance and Charles Gray, two actors who played Blofeld in the same scene, both in German uniform. In terms of the three suspects, you know, when they're introduced, we know that Charles Gray is a philanderer, so could his philandering go as far as murdering prostitutes? We know that O'Toole is quite brutal by nature, so he's a viable suspect. And the one thing we don't know about Donald Pleasance at the beginning is, uh, you know, Omar Sharif says he's the only one we can't find out anything about his private life. But then it later transpires he's, he's involved in the uh, July plot. But do you, would you agree with my hypothesis that this was a bit unlucky? I mean, where do you place films like The Dirty Dozen? Do you like them or do you think that they took war films off on this quite strange and divergent path? I like The Dirty Dozen, but that would be the kind of lowbrow thing I would suggest would be The Dirty Dozen, really. I mean, it's just a kind of action movie which doesn't take itself too seriously, if I remember correctly. And it's just more kind of on action rather than plot and exposition. I'm sure there's some Dirty Dozen fans are probably yelling at right now. But what I remember was it was just kind of a good action movie rather than something slightly more cerebral like Night of the Generals is. But I think sometimes people look for, and it is a contradiction in terms, they look for a fun war movie. And The Dirty Dozen strikes me as kind of a more fun war movie, whereas this is kind of all miserable. But it's more realistic in terms of its depiction of war. I was just thinking when you were saying, I've forgotten about Charles Gray being in it as well. And I thought, wouldn't it have been really fun if uh, Sean Connery had had a cameo and had walked in and seen Bluffelt and Bluffelt? There's two of <laughs> Well, I believe in the book, Spectre has Nazi roots, so oh. you, know, you, you never know. But it's interesting, Coral Brown, who, well, like I say, seems to be our go-to actress on Highbrow Lobro. At the beginning of the film, she's a, a true Nazi believer and uh, is basically, you know, trying to pimp off her daughter to Tanz because Tanz is going up in the Nazi hierarchy. Uh, but when we jump forward to 1944, and there's various references that German cities now have been obliterated in the Allied bombing campaigns, you, you know, she's pretty much in on the plot. Probably, you know, more so than a husband. Charles Gray is because Charles Gray has this uh, professional relationship with Pleasance where he's completely on the fence. And it's interesting to see how venal he is. He's waiting to see how the plot will go. And there's various references to him writing his memoirs because he's looking ahead to a post-war Germany where there's going to be the Nuremberg trials and there's going to be this accounting for all the actions of the Wehrmacht and, and things like that. So he's getting his excuses in early. Did you feel like the 1960s, the contemporary scenes as it was the 1960s when this was made, do you think they worked or do you think all that time jumping was a bit confusing? I could see the the jumping to Paris worked, but yes, jumping to the 1960s, I thought, again, you see the mystery could have been solved in the, the time jump in Paris. It, it seemed a bit disjointed to have all this kind of set in Nazi wartime. And then suddenly, like you say, the, it's the 60s and it's bang up to date. Yes, I thought if this is a war movie, maybe it should have just stayed in the war. I mean, the final jump could have been to the liberation of Berlin, for example, in 1945, rather than to the 60s. Although I can see why they did it. So it's the French police officer who solves the mystery in the end. I have to say, the actor who played him was as wooden as some of the doors on the set. I wasn't impressed with him in the cast. Uh, Philippe Noir Noiré, well, I think no. he's a big French star. Oh. But... Well, I, I'm sorry, but I just thought have you got some a quality cast around you and you're letting the side down and speaking of quality cast i'm so pleased that the director treated the audience with the um, intelligence that they deserved in that if we dress them up in nazi uniform and we set it in germany we don't need them all to try and do a whole range of dramatic accents we can just let them speak normally and the audience can use their gumption and work it out for themselves i'm a big fan of that if you can't do the accent then don't try uh, yeah, no, I, I think, you know, that's quite progressive. And, uh, and I think, you know, like I say about colorblind casting, which seems to be the new thing, that you can cast anyone, regardless of race. I, I don't know if you find that too jarring. I mean, I think the uh, the big example is Bridgerton, where you have black actors playing members of the British aristocracy in the 18th century and stuff like that. I, I mean, I don't know how far you can take it. I know the the film, the 1980 film, Seawolves, that caused controversy because I had a Jewish actress playing a German spy. Um mm. And I think a lot of people that were like, well, that's quite distasteful and 
I'm not sure about the actress herself or about anything. It's just like it's it's just acting, you know. I will own to its flaws. It's it's not a perfect film, but on this show we try to show the weird and the wonderful, and we try to show the things that might have been a little bit forgotten. You know, I'm sure if you're a, a Peter O'Toole fan, you've seen Lawrence of Arabia. If you're an Omar Sharif fan, you've seen Funny Girl and Doctor Zhivago. But you you might not have seen this one. This one seems to have fallen through the cracks a little bit. So. I, I do strongly recommend The Night of the Generals. Uh, it's, it's a film I saw almost by accident because I just noticed the VHS when I was a kid and uh, when I was slightly older than that, a young teen, I suppose, and uh, bought it and, and loved it. And I think its reputation started to grow through uh, repeated showings on television and, and stuff like that on channels like Talking Dex TV and, and the fact that you have such a good cast and actors like Tom Courtney who if anything seems to be doing his kind of angry young man face but like you say yeah that, that seems to work because you know Tom Courtney seems to have a slightly you know, more northern inflection to his voice whereas O'Toole's kind of articulation suits uh, being a Nazi because you think well is he of Prussian or aristocratic extraction or you know or grey and pleasance you know would have been quite upper middle class sounding actors and that seems to suit the fact that they're generals so they're quite high up the packing order so they don't need to try and imitate any hammy German accents. With actors like that you've got confidence in them so when they start talking then you, you know that they embody these characters. So to wrap up yeah The Night of the Generals I think it's one of the most extraordinary and certainly unusual war films. It's massively ambitious and occasionally it doesn't quite hit all of the targets that it's aiming for, but, you know, it hits enough of them for you to love this film, or at the very least, it will probably grow on you. There's a lot of scenes here that will that will stick in your mind. We, we've talked about some of them. The witness at the Bordello is probably the pimp who, is, who, who spots the um, grey trouser leg and the command red stripe of the German general, and then the trip to the Louvre that General Tanz makes where he spots the painting, the, the self-portrait of Van Gogh and begins to have a seizure and many other scenes the Christopher Plummer cameo that all just stick in your mind and and I think you know that's some of the best things we can hope for from cinema in an age where films aren't as ambitious as they used to be if they're ambitious at all I'd, I'd rather have a film that strives you know high and then somewhat misses but certainly comes through with a lot of dignity and uh, interest and uh, it's one I revisit you know once every few years because I love it so much so that's my hyper recommendation for this week's show, The Night of the Generals. Excellent. Right. Well, you mentioned The Dirty Dozen, and my recommendation has been described as The Dirty Dozen in Space. And it's Rogue One, or no, to give its full title, Rogue One, A Star Wars Story, which is Gareth Edwards' contribution to the franchise in Christmas 2016. And it's a standalone story. But its plot can be summed up by the line in Star Wars, um, the original Star Wars, where they said about rebels getting the plan for the Death Star. And one of the reasons I suggested was because you, Steve, uh, when you mentioned one of your critiques of Star Wars was, why would you build something as powerful as the Death Star and give it a little vulnerability that all it took was a shot down an exhaust pipe? And this film answers that question in that it was built under duress, so the vulnerability was deliberately built into it in the hope that someday somebody would take advantage of it and destroy it. This is basically the story of the rebels who got those plans. So the plot of Rogue One it concerns Jyn Erso, played by Felicity Jones, and it starts off with a young Jin on a planet with her dad, Galen Erso, played by Mads Mikkelsen, and um, her mum. So Orson Krennic, who's played by Ben Mendelsohn, arrives to pressure Galen Erso into completing the plans for the Death Star. And when he refuses, he just kidnaps him and shoots the mum. And Jin goes into hiding. And then she's eventually rescued by Saw Gerrera, that's the Forrest Whitaker character. And so begins her kind of journey to find out what her father was up to. At first, all she finds out is he designed the Death Star. So then she goes on a kind of mission to kill him. And then it turns out she finds out that he did it under duress. So and there are ways to destroy it. And along the way, she kind of she builds up or joins a motley crew of people who have their own reasons. For example, there's an imperial droid that's been reprogrammed called K2SO. There's a blind Jedi master who's called <laughs> a name I can't pronounce. I'm really sorry. Okay. I'm just looking at it and I can't pronounce it. First name Chirrut, I think. It is like the Dirty Dozen. There's all these people from different areas of life just kind of chucked together. And just to give you an idea of how ramshackle it is, when they're trying to launch from the rebel base and they get asked by the equivalent of air traffic control, what's your call sign? And they're like, um, 
uh, and somebody just goes, Rogue One, say Rogue One. And they go, Rogue One. So that's how they get their call sign, just somebody thinks it up on the hoof uh, from the moment. As the film progresses, even though the Death Star is in a prototype, um, they see demonstrations of its power because Sogarera's hideout gets caught up in a blast. It's quite good in that, although a lot of these characters are new, they do tie in some characters that you will recognize from Star Wars, like Darth Vader's in it. The Peter Cushing character, Grand Moff Tarkin, is digitally recreated. And in fact, Krennic thinks he's the one in charge, but there's a kind of power struggle going on there as well. So it ties in with the original Star Wars very well. And then towards the end, they basically land on the planet where the plans are stored. And like any Star Wars movie, there's an almighty battle on many fronts and each is relying on the other to break through in some capacity. Eventually, they find the plans. But then one of the things that struck me was, I mean, this film got rated to 12 and on the final beachhead, it's a very good battle, but the body count is very high. I mean, people, you don't see people getting blown up into little bits, but you do kind of see bodies getting thrown through explosions. I mean, it's no secret, really, that pretty much everybody dies in this film. Nobody survives. Anybody on the planet, one of the final scenes is when Jin and Cassian realise they're not going to make it off the planet. Watching this again, I thought, I had the same feeling with this with, like, with No Time to Die. When you finally realise that actually... They're going to do the unthinkable and kill Bond. And the same way, they're going to do the unthinkable and kill everybody off here. Then after a while, you think, well, okay, I'll just accept that. And just, just a certain... Did you not find, whenever you realised what was going to happen, just everything seemed very calm and you just kind of accepted the moment? Yeah, I did, because I felt like some of the weaknesses of the earlier Star Wars films is that, at least towards the end, the, the, yeah, the Empire and the Death Star was too easily overpowered. Yeah. So I feel like you've always got to show that the the empire is sinister and serious. And in this, yeah, the empire is is, is pretty um, brutal and therefore you've got to show them under threat. So I, I didn't mind that. It is very much a war film because they are in a constant state of war. They kind of hint that there's moments when, you know, not so much a ceasefire, but there's, there's lulls between the battle sequences. But I also felt Ben Mendelsohn was one of the best villains because like many army officers, he's a careerist. And he's, he's trying to um, push his career forward, but, you know, by the most evil means possible. Because I hadn't watched a Star Wars film in, in years, so I forgot about... So the Empire, by definition, has an emperor. And then I was like, oh, Darth Vader's a lord. So, okay, so Darth Vader's like a member of the aristocracy. Below that, you have the generals and the officer class. So I started to get very interested in the hierarchy. And then I started to ask myself questions like... Well, I wonder what the empire's main economy is. You know, do they specialize in imports and exports? You know, are they funded mostly by taxation? I was just like, okay, well, those questions I'm not going to get an answer to. So I'd better leave those questions alone. But um, I did enjoy it. And, you know, let me ask you a question. I'm not a huge fan of the franchise, but even people who are big fans would probably have to say that since The Phantom Menace, the series has been up and down. And I'd say probably Phantom Menace was the lowest point, which was a shame because it was the comeback film. Do you feel if the series had been like this film from the start of the relaunch in the late 90s, do you feel like if more of the films like would have been like this, then there would have been less disappointment in the series? Well, the idea of the standalone films was to bridge the gap because Star Wars, the plan was it's a Christmas event, but we can't have a Star Wars film every year, but we can have a spin-off film in the gap so this for example was filled the gap between the force awakens and the last jedi and then solo which was released in march i know that was meant to do the same thing now the plan was to have all these standalone movies to fill in the gaps and what you're seeing now in the television on whatever street is at disney plus like the obi-wan miniseries that was meant to be a movie there was meant to be one for boba fett as well so uh, there was going to be a lot of these origin films but had they been to the standard of Rogue one that would have worked really well the problem then was the last jedi i didn't mind although it rewrote a lot of continuity and then obviously the, a lot of fans got upset so in the final one they have to go back and reverse all the changes that were made by ryan johnson in the last jedi which i just thought it was a bit of a mess and i mean i'm not going to spoil anything i think the kind of the big big body at the end of um the rise of skywalker was the Emperor from Return of the Jedi, whereas I thought they're missing a trick. The big bad guy should have been Vader. Bring Vader back, because he's been present 
as a child all the way through through all nine of them so i thought the last one was a wasted opportunity if you're listening to this and you thought oh i can't be bothered with any of the sequels but you like star wars do yourself a favor and watch rogue one because it's tied more into the original star wars universe in fact the last scene of rogue one plays immediately into the start of the original Star Wars, if I can put it to you that way. It's that linked into it that it finishes just as the original would be starting. And I think there's a lot for you to enjoy in that. And I think the fact that the stories of all these characters are pretty much all told. Now, I mean, I know Cassian Andor, he's getting a prequel coming up, which um, the robot may or may not appear in. But for example, Jyn Erso's story was expanded through a graphic novel and a book but her story is told now and none of them appear in any of the other trilogy things now um i was speaking to um a colleague of mine and he told me because he reads the books that in fact the robot character county so in the books is the one who steals the plans because he's been reprogrammed so he goes he goes rogue and steals the death star plans so obviously that book is now no longer canon thanks to this film but I think it makes for a far more exciting story to have kind of a whole ragtag bunch of people who you can associate with and cheer for. I think it works far better. And you're absolutely right about Ben Meldenson. When I was watching this, I thought, God, you are ruthless. I mean, Vader has a slight comic element to him. And Tarkin is just, you know, he's like the Peter Cushion character. But I just thought, you're an absolute thug. You're actually quite frightening for a Star Wars villain. And watching it again, I thought, you'd probably murder your own family. You probably have. To get ahead in your career, yeah. <laughs> he's unstoppable, and, so, and the only thing that will stop him is Vader. And you think, oh my goodness! A couple of things you might be interested in. The original story was that the only one, the only character that would die was K2SO. It was when they started doing research, they thought, why don't we let's go for this and kill them all? Also, like any trailer, there's a couple of shots that appear there that don't make it into the final movie. Whenever Tony Guilfoy was brought in for reshoots, now it depends what interview you read, whether he actually reshot the entire battle sequence or whether he just did a few tweaks to the script. One of the things I do know he did, there's a shot of Jin and Cassian running along the beach. She's got something clipped to her belt, which is the plans for the Death Star. And they're running along the beach getting shot at. Now, one of Guilfoy's suggestions was, why not have the transmitter in the same building as where the plans are stored? So they don't have to come out of one building, run along the beach and then climb up the other, which I thought was a good little tweak. Why not? Kind of keeps the pacing going. And the other scene where the lights come on and it's Felicity Jones just turning around looking at the camera, that was a lighting test. So it was kind of, let's test the lights to get the act actor in place turn them on and they loved it so much they thought well if we can't put it in the film we could at least put it in the trailer and it's quite a dramatic thing now of course felicity jones at, at this point had been playing period pieces and had been on the archers so she does play the kind of rough character very well i thought and it's a shame that there doesn't appear to be any further plans to develop her character i think everybody acquits even forrest whitaker who has as many mannerisms in this as he did in Taken 3, acquits himself well. It's certainly better than some of the sequels, and it is probably... I'd say it's my second favourite. Do you know that? After Empire Strikes Back. with Felicity Jones, she showed her Star Wars credentials by saying she enjoyed um, Empire Strikes Back when she was growing up. And I'd be with her on that one. I think it's the best, and I think this comes in a very close second. It's not perfect. There are a few pacing issues. But I think certainly once the battle takes off at the end, then it just never lets up. And I, I just think it's great. And like Die Hard, you never think these guys are going to win because yeah. Krennic is just always on their tail. You know, you just think he always seems to be, you know, in the right place at the right time and can just take them out and just seems to be able to have so many tricks up his sleeve. So that was the other thing I thought, are these guys actually going to win? Now, of course, you know when you know that they do win, but it's just what will be the cost of them winning. Yeah. And, of course, it's their lives. When I watched it, I found myself picking up little things rather than having an overall critique. But I did feel, because of the war theme of this podcast episode, that maybe there was a parallel that we're trying to make a specific or whatnot in that the Nazi war machine, they actually use slave labour. And a lot of these uh, slaves, or they were the concentration camp inmates or, you know, refugees or allied prisoners of war, they did everything they could to sabotage the equipment they were building. So I know that's not exactly what happens in this film, but I, I wondered if, uh, if the filmmakers were aware of that parallel. But another thing, because I haven't been following the series in recent years, I was amused that the stormtroopers actually speak a little this time. 
that's the thing. In episode two, Attack of the Clones, a lot of them are cloned, but they are human or humanoid. So that was always the thing. Are they human or are they robots? But yes, they've always been able to speak a bit in the Star Wars movies. Don't forget, I mean, there's the bit where Obi-Wan says, one of them, these aren't the droids you're looking for. And one of them goes, these aren't the droids we're looking for. But I see what you mean. The kind of level of dialogue was far more in this one. And they weren't kind of the robotic characters that they've always been portrayed. If you remember in The Force Awakens, uh, John Boyega plays a, um, a rebel stormtrooper who gets blood on his helmet and then decides to join the Rebel Alliance. And I think the inference there is that he's human and no mention of him being a clone. So what the stormtroopers actually are seems to develop through the movies. And I'm sure there's somebody somewhere can probably go into more detail, but there's a certain kind of ambiguity as to what they are. I think those are the questions that the fanboys love. It's like what I was thinking about earlier, where have like in terms of the economies of these two rival powers, like how do the economies operate and function and whatnot? Do they have periodic ceasefires with each other? Is that hinted at? Because like I said, there did seem like there's certain lulls with battle sequences. Well, is that a question too far? I don't know. I think that's the kind of thing that would be covered in the books and graphic novels and things like Star Wars Rebels. The Star Wars universe is quite large and there are so many different plot lines flying around, which some of which contradict each other. I imagine somewhere in there, there'd be something about their economies and the kind of overall war. There is a gap in time between the end of the third one, Revenge of the Sith, and the original Star Wars, which I think Obi-Wan, the miniseries, is now beginning to explore. But that is a period of time in which the, the rebels are defeated and the Jedi Knights have been sent into exile. The war is over during that time, but certainly once the movies start again, I think the whole point is each trilogy, I think the war is ongoing throughout each one, and then it stops, then there's a period of time, then the next one picks it up and the war keeps going, and then there's a a victory on one side and then of course the force awakens is after a certain period of time so i think within each trilogy the war is continuous but between each trilogy there is a period of well i'm not going to say peace but calm well i've got a little anecdote for you i wonder if you've heard of this one i only came across this by chance but it's worth mentioning here i was watching an interview with uh, david cronenberg it was one of those clips where they show him going into the video store and just looking at the you know the video boxes and picking out his favorite mov- movies so. Criterion Collection does an interesting one like that as well. But he's talking through his films, and then he mentions in the late 70s when his career was taking off. I wonder if you know the story. He said he got a phone call one day from someone in LucasArts or whatever the precursor that was. He said, uh, would you be interested in directing the new Star Wars film, Revenge of the Jedi? And he was like, oh, I don't know. I only really direct my own material. And then suddenly the voice said, goodbye, hung up. <laughs> and he said he was he was shocked because he was like, oh, I think I think I was expecting some wooing there. I was expecting, you know, a little <laughs> bit of um, bartering at the very least. Uh, but he said, but I think he, I think he knew in his heart that that was never going to be a collaboration that was going to work. You know, Cronenberg doing a Star Wars film. But you know, correct me if I'm wrong. But he said later he found out that the script was changed to Return of the Jedi because the Jedi's don't believe in revenge. That's absolutely right. That was George Lucas said that. And yet you've got Revenge of the Sith, um, which are the Dark Jedis at the at the end of the uh, episode three. You're absolutely right. So he did use revenge in there. But can you can you imagine Cronenberg doing Star Wars? The amount of body horror he'd put in there. <laughs> yeah. You know, you'd have some new stormtrooper which would have like an organic lightsaber grown into his body or something to I mean, that's what. When was that? Nineteen eighty-three. So he'd, he'd just come off video drone by that stage. I mind you, would have, would he have done the dead zone? Let me see what Cronenberg was doing in eighty-three. Just give me a second. I I, I think he'd he'd want to see Emperor Palantine's personal torture chamber. Yeah. And Darth Vader's S and M predilection. Or well, who knows? Maybe Luke's S and M predilection. You know, I think he'd really shake things up. But uh, I imagine that would upset some of the fans. So. He'd done scanners in 1981. Can you imagine? And then Videodrome in the Dead Zone. And then he, the next thing he did was the fly. So can you imagine if he'd done Star Wars, the amount of body horror that would have gone on in there? That would have been fabulous. Darth Vader <laughs> takes, off, takes off his helmet and it's just an absolute mess under there, you know? And <laughs> like I say, organic lightsabers growing out of all sorts. Or, you know, Luke having a punch up with somebody and he plunges his fist into the person's chest or something like in the thing I know I know that's Carpenter like uh, or you know the videotape going into James Woods's chest and Videodrome oh man it could have been brilliant 
Oh, that's a yeah. opportunity. Instead, we get Richard Markland, who I've never heard of before or since. Right, He's I've been... never heard of him either. Let's, um, let's have a quick look at what Mr. Markland did. But while you're doing that, I want to say I heard recently that Cronenberg and John Carpenter have had a falling out. Oh. Yeah, apparently they were friends for you. This is, you know, straight from John Carpenter's mouth. He was asked about the Masters of Horror dinners that they periodically have and they get together with Carpenter, Cronenberg, you know, the late Wes Craven used to attend and the younger lot like Eli Roth and Darren Aronofsky. Carpenter went along to one and, and suddenly David Cronenberg blanked him, which he was upset about because then known each other for years but he put it down to Cronenberg taking himself too seriously recently but I don't know I, I obviously we haven't had any reaction from David Cronenberg whether he said it well, was a misunderstanding or something I, I, I really don't know but it, it does bring me to another question and I think any long-running franchise has to answer this like for instance James Bond series if we're talking about the original films there were three original films and then there was a gap of was it about 15 years about that yes and now they've been going, since The Phantom Menace, the series has been fairly prolific. They've been going for another 25 years. Now, that makes me feel old, as someone who went to see The Phantom Menace and was bitterly disappointed. And um, I, I did enjoy going to see, in the mid-90s, when they re-released them with um, all the bits added in. For instance, Harrison Ford stepping on Yabba the Hutt's tail. Yeah. And him going, ow, which were wonderful. But have they successfully bridged the divide between the older fans and the younger fans? I mean, one story about that disastrous Phantom Menace is that Mark Commode and Simon Mayo, then working for the BBC, did a competition where the Star Wars fan got to go with them to LA to the film premiere. And the chap who went was a diehard Star Wars fan. He, he loved them as a kid and, you know, he's an adult now. They went to see the Phantom Menace and he came out of it. And Kermode said he was heartbroken. He was just heartbroken. It was kind of cruel because oh, no. the film had been... I mean, let's face it, that film is witless and charmless. Oh, it's awful. Oh, it's yeah. terrible. How can you take the future Darth Vader seriously when his kind of shortened form, his name is Annie, and they're all calling him Annie? You know, it's like, it's just this Anakin Skywalker. The only thing, the only line in that, which I found amusing, was when Obi-Wan said to him, jokingly, you'll be the death of me. And we thought, oh, 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 yeah, very good. And Jar Jar Binks, what were they thinking with Jar Jar Binks? Honestly, Jar Jar Binks kickstarted the fan editing movement, I tell you now. Star Wars The Phantom Menace 1.1 came out where they reduced a lot of the Jar Jar Binks stuff. And that's why Jar Jar gets reduced appearances in the subsequent ones, because the fan fallout over Jar Jar. I mean, you've got to admit. And what, you know, accent was he meant to be speaking as well? It was like, it was all just a complete misfire. I think uh, I blanked a lot of this, but I think that's the problem with George Lucas isn't a very good writer. Carrie Fisher, I think, tweaked some of the dialogue on um, Empire and Return of the Jedi. Partly the love scenes between Han Solo and Princess Leia. Both of them said, George, you can write this, but you can't say it. Just the language. Apparently, it was so clunky. And you only need to look at how clunky the love scenes are between Natalie Portman and Hayden Christensen, you know, as um, Padme and Anakin in the second and the third one. It's just, oh, it's just painful to listen to. I think getting the likes of Lawrence Kasdan in to help with Empire. What helps Empire and Return of the Jedi is different directors and co-writers to come in and massage the script. The problem is with the first three, George wrote and directed, and you need a bit of quality control going on there, and it's sadly lacking with the first three in many respects. You're reawaking all kinds of horrible memories. Can we go back to Rogue One? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, back to Rogue One. I, I watched it with my better half, and she didn't know that Peter Cushing had passed away long ago. I think in the early 90s he passed. So, you know, I told her that at the end, and, and she was surprised but impressed. And, and I think he does look good. She was slightly less impressed by the appearance of Carrie Fisher. Oh, yeah, that was terrible. I just It looked so artificial. I thought, how could they get Peter Cushing so right and Carrie Fisher so wrong? I think it's partly yeah. because they got Peter Cushing as he was, an old man. He, I mean, he was already old when they did the original Star Wars and, you know, he had sunken cheeks and, you know, lines on his forehead and stuff. Whereas, like, when Carrie Fisher shows up, it was just like, oh, she looks like Joan Rivers or something. Her face is completely blank. Is this the only one they've had her in artificially or has she been in more? She was in The Rise of Skywalker, but her scenes had been shot in the previous one, The Last Jedi, but then when she passed away... The original idea was that The Last Jedi would be Luke's movie, 
And then the rise of Skywalker would pretty much be Princess Leia would be the central past character in that. But what they did was whenever Carrie Fisher passed away, they rejigged the order of her scenes. So what you see of her is previously filmed material being used posthumously. And I think there was a bit of digital manipulation as well. So a bit like the Oliver Reed gladiator. Yes, yes, that kind of thing. So it's just a rejigging of already filmed material. And if there was any digital manipulation that went on, it wasn't quite so obvious as that one in Rogue One. I don't know what went wrong there. I think they asked Gareth Edwards, why, why didn't you just get her in to, to shoot the scenes? And I get the impression there was a slight bit of snobbery on set that this was seen as a side project that maybe wasn't as important as the major ones. And, you know, he just said, I could never seem to be able to get hold of Carrie Fisher. And maybe, like I say, there was a slight bit of snobbery going on there. Who knows? But that, for me, is the only real clunky bit in the movie. I thought bringing Peter Cushing back was very well done. Donald Pleasant's is brought back in Halloween Kills, by the way. And it works because it's used sparingly. Most of the time he's in shadow, so you don't get to look at his face too closely. They only use him for a couple of lines of dialogue. Whoever says the dialogue does it pretty well. So when used sparingly, I think it works really well. Yeah. I think the problem with Carrie Fisher is it's a right old close-up of her face. Mm. And then it just, you can just see that it's not as good as it could be. The other example that leaps to mind is Marlon Brando in Superman Returns. I think that's actually footage from the Richard Donner Superman that Kevin Spacey as Lex Luthor is watching. I don't know if there was any digital manipulation used in that, but I would say it works because it's brief and Mm -hmm. tastefully judged. But uh, yeah, no, I enjoyed the Star Wars film and I think what you're saying there about there being snobbery, about it being slightly excluded, I think all of that works to its advantage speaking to friends who are much more involved in the series, I've said, yeah, this one is much better than The Phantom Menace and The Nadeur. Um, some of the more recent ones, as I said, have been a bit depressing, because even though in this one everybody gets killed, it's actually quite exhilarating, mm-hmm. because you know they've died for a purpose. I did enjoy this one. Maybe towards the end, I thought it was running out a little bit of steam, but I think it's been the best of the bunch. Just a quick update on Richard Marquand. He did direct Eye of the Needle, and then he went on to do Jagged Edge, but then unfortunately he passed away just short of his 50th birthday in 1987. So that's why we haven't heard much from Mr. Markland. But Jagged Edge was a good one as well. Yeah, uh, God, I remember that scaring the bejeebus out of me. Uh, oh, well, there you go. Then. Yeah. So, so I'm glad you enjoyed Rogue One. For me, suggesting it was another excuse for me to watch it again, which I enjoyed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you for listening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, We've really enjoyed talking about these two war films. They are both very different, but they're both, I think, excellent war films in their way. And uh, again, I'm I'm always happy to go to bat for for Night of the Generals. I think it's one of the most ambitious and slightly unconventional war films, despite being set during the Second World War, which we know through our histories very, very well. Wonderful cast interesting story many subplots they're very well written so you know i can't recommend it enough rogue one as well is is a wonderful sci-fi film and an excellent addition to the science fiction canon if i can just say about rogue one there's a few star wars fans i've spoken to who've never seen it and i have to say i think you're doing yourself a disservice by not watching it it works very well as a double bill watch rogue one and then go straight into star wars episode four and the two sit together very well and I think if you've kind of got fed up of the Star Wars universe due to the sequels, do yourself a favour and at least give this one a shot. OK, if you already know the films, perhaps this will inspire a revisit. And if you haven't seen them yet, then please do go out and watch them and, and let us know what you think. Were we completely wider the mark or were we, you know, bang on the money? We're always, we're always mm-hmm. interested to hear your feedback. OK, thank you very much. And until next time, bye. Bye bye. You've been listening to Highbrow Lowbrow, presented by Steve Pyle and Dan Slattery. We'd love to hear from you, and you can contact us by going to our link tree. That's linkpr.ee forward slash highbrow lowbrow. Until next time, keep it highbrow and lowbrow.